99.5% of us, this is what we're going to end up with. And if you go into the industry knowing that this is the sort of frothy, choppy type of career path that you're going to end up with, it can be worked with. If there's going to be points where it's troublesome, there's going to be points where you pour all your heart into something and it's not going to go anywhere. Um, but it, um, you know, but, but eventually, from a distance, and when you look back on your career, you see ultimately something that looks a little bit more like this. Okay, so a little bit of backstory. I programmed my first game for the Apple IIe. Um, my first, I mean, from from, from the screen all the way to end credits. Um, I worked on it with another programmer. There were two of us building it together. Um, it was a lot of fun. It was kind of complicated. Um, but this is actually where I first got introduced to the idea of computer graphics in general. Um, because everything had to be written out manually. Right. If you wanted to put a pixel on the screen, you had to type in H plot this location, V plot this location, and everything had to be plotted out. So we could draw our stuff out on graph paper, right? And and then literally just write the numbers into the code, and you would have a picture. Um, and you could, you know, and you had to do the colors manually too, uh, which was green at the time. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the bar the color variance, if you were fortunate enough to have a color screen, which no one ever I, I ever knew had color. We had one guy who had an orange screen instead of a green screen, which was really, really special. Um, but the colors would change the uh, the intensity of the pixel. So you could still get sort of a black and white type grayscale image if you were really determined to get that. Um, and so we did a lot of, uh, this was 19, early 1980s, right? So the consumer computer was a new thing. Being able to have a computer in your home was new and exciting. And uh, the, the school that I attended basically gave us a whole bunch of computers and said, here's the book, go make great things, right? Which was, you know, <coughs> 10, 11, 12 year olds was the coolest thing ever. Uh, and so we would, we would, whoever got a game would bring it in and we'd spend like a week hacking it. And we'd figure out how they did everything. We'd figure out how they were, they were, um, uh, you know, creating the illusion of depth within any given screen. And we were figuring out how they were calling their enemies and how they were making the enemy, the enemies explode when you shot them. Um, how they were building little mini sort of database type thing. Weren't really like what we have now database wise. We spent a lot of time, time uh, hacking around and figuring that out. Um, and then when I got out of this school and I transitioned to high school, I got away from computers entirely. And I got away from art entirely for a long time. Um, a big percentage of that was access. Um, the, the school that I transferred to took computers very seriously. In the old IBM, you don't touch this unless you have a degree kind of seriously. Um, everything was hyper-regulated. Students were not permitted in the classroom. We could not turn the computers on without having an adult present. And so, you know, coming from ultimate freedom where I can break anything I want to, okay, here are the rules, that was, you know, at 12 years old, you're out. You're like, you know, and if I don't have to be here, I'm done. Um, so I, I had a hiatus for a few years. I got back into art. And then when I went to college, I did my first undergrad up at UC Davis, um, I had access to everything. I had a lab full of spark stations and probably a dozen kids in that lab who were perfectly willing to help me figure stuff out. Right? And so as I continued working with computers and as I continued moving into working with art on computers, first by coding it in manually and then by moving to things like Photoshop, um, this was all assemblage. Right. My first degree is in English. <laughs> All right. This is not necessarily conducive. Uh, the games I make these days are primarily narrative games, so I have a huge pool of, of information and cultural canon that I can draw on when I make my games from my English major. But all the things that I use in games are things that I found, right? things that I went out and said, you know what, I need to make this thing go. I'm going to go talk to that guy over there. Uh, I have had no formal computer class training through any of this. I tried to get into a computer class once, and they asked me to leave because I wasn't a CS major, I was an English major, and I'm not sure they could wrap their head around the idea that an English major might want to learn how to code, so I, uh, I, I just went back to the lab 
and continue mm -hmm. making more stuff. And you know, at this point, there's a pattern, right? No matter what I'm doing, no matter what my formal uh, uh, path in life happened to be, I was going out and I was collecting things. I was building my own things. I was figuring out how to use software that you know, very few people knew how to use. Um, by the end of college, I was teaching myself 3D animation. Um, I had an Amiga 3000 and was using some of the open source software that was available to actually do 3D, 3D animations and uh, 3D renderings. And this was the early old school stuff. This is back when Alias was still written in Fortran. So uh, very, very uh, polygon heavy. Uh, Lawnmower Man era, if any of you guys remember. I have witnessed, <laughs> uh, see the shutter. Uh, witnessed the Lawnmower Man, uh, which for the time was brilliant. But it wasn't until Pixar that we figured out what to do uh, with with uh, art and computer animation. So eventually, I fast forward a couple of years. Um, I spent a couple of years as a stockbroker. I spent a couple of years working in the business side of things. Um, I started one or two small businesses and, and either um, completely misfired or I sold them off uh, for pennies because that's what they were worth to me at the time. Um, and I eventually decided that if I was going to do games and if I was going to stop, you know, hanging out in my uh, in my room and, and farting around and uh, doing stuff like, uh, uh, you know, adding my coworkers' faces to uh, to Doom, <laughs> I could actually go in and, and do something with it. Right? I actually had to make a commitment um, at that point. So I went and I applied to a couple of art schools. Um, I got into the Art Center College of Design. And I went in as an illustration major, which is their catch-all major. Um, if you don't know what you want to do, you end up as an illustration major. Um, and I ended up spending the next three years retconning my degree. So I took, I managed to swap out classes from transportation design. I swapped in classes from production design. I swapped in, um, I think I skipped all of the actual formal computing art classes that they were teaching because at that point I was the TA for the art classes because I was the only one who could get in and kill a process from a computer down the hallway when something crashed. Um, and so by the, by the time I was done there, I was teaching uh, in my one, I was teaching Alias um, at both Art Center and Santa Monica College. And I had started to pick up my first game jobs. Uh, and when I went to school at Art Center, I went with the idea that I was going to go into games or I was going to go into CGI. I mean, this was not, I was not going there to become an artist in the classical sense and, and paint nudes or work in advertising or, some, or animate for Disney. I was going into computer digital art, um, which is possibly one of the things that actually got me in, is that I had a clear focus. And it was a weird focus for, uh, for the illustration major, I will have to say. I don't know many illustration majors. Everybody I know, they're, they're from trans or they're from, from product design, because I spent so much time messing with their gear. Um, and so when I started getting into, when I got out of, out, of, out of that degree program, I went to work for my first game studio, which was called Creative Minds. And we were making a game for Donald Trump. <laughs> which is fairly poetic. <laughs> so it was supposed to be a real estate trading game, and we were convinced we could make it in first person. And the comparison point that it made, it was supposed to be a first person real estate trading game on a par with Duke Nukem. What? I don't. Yeah, I don't know where. I don't know where this pitch came from. But this is how it was given to me. Please tell me he's uh, the main supervillain. You know, the, the game actually never got finished. Um, it was. We were. It was a very small studio. It was one programmer who had tried to make the entire game himself, but got to a point where he had to bring in other other personnel. We got about. We got up to the point of building a demo for the game and actually building a working model of the game. Um, and then everything sort of came unglued, um, and, and the, uh, the, the studio ended up folding and they weren't able to complete the product. Uh, so, which is actually probably, probably for the best <laughs> at the end of the day. Uh, and then from, from there I went working, uh, you know, working in textures, worked on Stuart Little, then I transitioned completely into games with Star Sphere Interactive. <coughs> we were working on the very first port of Civilization for the PlayStation 2. And this was when PlayStation 2 was still, it was still in the works, so we had early prototype stuff. And 
putting civilization on a console is a nightmare. Mm -hmm. um, I am stunned that they even managed it for the Xbox. And the thing that we ran across was we had to, we would have had to redesign the game, right? I mean, Civilization, for those of you who haven't played Civ or Civ 2, 3, 4, 5, 20, space, future, um, it is a very deep resource management game, time resource management. You're trying to take over the world. And there's layers and layers. And you have technology trees that will cover this entire wall if you were to try and draw them out. And trying to cram all that into a console was not going to happen. Uh, and we weren't allowed to do a redesign. We had to attempt to replicate the game exactly. Um, so that didn't go very far at the end of the day. Um, we got some really cool um, solutions out of it, some really cool uh, uh, rendering techniques out of it on the technical side, but the game itself didn't, didn't quite go. But one of the things I kept running across when I uh, worked at all of these different studios um, was that I kept running back and forth between the art station and the programming stations. And when I worked at Rhythm and Use, artists were all the way up here on like the fourth floor, and the programmers were all the way down here in the basement. And so I would, and this was before we had stuff like elevators <coughs> where we could actually paint on the surface. So we had to unwrap the surface of our model and paint on it. Um, you know, while it was flat. And so what would happen is I'd have to load a texture, and then if I wanted to see what it looked like on the model, I had to run downstairs to my programmer and say, hey, can you throw this up on the screen for me? I've done another update. Uh, and so I ran up and down a lot of stairs. Uh, and this continued. When I went to different studios, what I found is I kept having to harass the programmers whenever I had um, tricky assets or complicated assets that were being dropped into uh, whatever game engine we were using. Because uh, I was working with small studios, a lot of those studios had their own proprietary engines. This was the era where if you wanted to be somebody, you had to have your own engine. Right? That's what people were funding. They weren't funding your games. They were funding the possibility of having the next Quake engine or the next Unreal engine. And eventually what happened is I would work with the programmers to build in-house tools. Um, and there's, I have copies of probably 20 different sets that we built. Um, and then it got to the point where the programmer would give me the tool and then I'd start tweaking it. I'd be, well, show me where this piece of programming is and I'll, and I'll tweak this here and I'll tweak that there. Because I had, from back when I was programming for the Apple IIe, I had an understanding of programming structure. Um, things like order of operations, how things are executed, how you separate one piece of code from another, um, how two pieces of code may talk to each other within any given program. Um, and so eventually, I, um, I would get tools that would allow me to deliver different, uh, different art assets even more quickly. Because there is nothing I hate more than lag. Whether it be on my computer or in real life, that length of time between when I can deliver an asset and then move on to the next asset, I like that to be as short as humanly possible. Um, so, Fast forward another year or two. Um, at, at that point, I was mostly snoodling about, right? I was taking other people's code and breaking it um, and adjusting integers here and there. And um, the kicker for me going from being an artist to being a programmer was when I went freelance. Um, so one of the studios that I was working for, Blue Planet Software, finally went belly up. And I said, you know what? I'm going to hang out my shingle and see how it does, right? And like every single person in this room, I had a stack of game ideas like this big that I wanted to get made. Uh, and I had pitched game ideas to my uh, to the different studios that I've worked at before. None of them had ever gone anywhere, but I still had them. Um, and I still wanted to see if I could make something out of them. Um, but And I had the advantage of being an artist in that I could build my design document. And I could do lots of pretty renders and, and concept art. But at this point in time, back in the 90s, the big studios funded a lot of games based on pretty concept art and good design documents. And a lot of those games went <laughs> So by the time I got around to doing my own, my own pitching, I now had to have a demo. Right. So, and that was the only way you could even get in the door. You could call the producer, the producer would say, great, send me your design document. You'd send over the design document, and they'd go, this looks fabulous, where's the demo? Uh, they're like, call me when you have a demo. 
and that was that was the end of many many conversations. Um, and you know, no no demo, no meeting. Um, so I put together a couple of different small teams uh, from from various mod communities, and we started building demos. Uh, pretty much all of these that you're looking at here, these are all based on uh, Unreal Tournament and Unreal Tournament 2 engine graphics. Um, and so we would build demos and we were throwing lots of ideas at the wall to see, um, to see what we could get to stick. Um, and then when the mobile industry kicked into gear, I figured it would be easier for me to get funding for a, a smaller gamble, right, for building a, a game for mobile. A lot of my freelance work had started taking me into working with mobile. Um, I worked on the Incredibles mobile game. I worked on the Ben Helsing mobile game. Um, I did some stuff for Major, Major League Baseball. Um, a couple of uh, OEM releases for, uh, for Nokia were in the works. So I had a good handle. <coughs> Not only did I have a good handle on mobile now, but mobile, when it started, was very much like doing art for like the 286 and the 386. Um, you know, back in the day, right? That experience carried over almost exactly. Uh, so I started getting, uh, started putting together working demos, but we needed to start moving them to mobile. And, you know, finding mobile programmers was very, very difficult. Uh, most programmers were still working in the AAA space or they were working in the PC space. Mobile was still kind of considered a, a uh, you know, an upstart. Uh, it was, no one was sure if it was going to go anywhere. And then the smartphones came out. And so I had, had demos to make. But, um, and this is the point in the story where people go, well, why didn't you just hire a programmer? Find a mobile programmer. But I'll point out that artists make like half as much as programmers do. So my actually having the cash to hire a programmer <coughs> was pretty much a no-go. And there's this thing that happens in the game industry in particular. Um, where people are like, well, if your idea is awesome enough, the programmers will work for you for free. <laughs> and I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, he knows that this is a crop, but this is the kind of thing that you do hear from from uh, management, particularly if they're not from the games industry, and if they didn't come up from the bottom, if they came over from advertising, if they came over from business software, um, you know, that's their, that's their proof is in the pudding. If you can talk people into building this for free, then you have a great idea, right? But it doesn't doesn't work out that well at the end of the day. The other problem I ran into is that I'm in the Bay Area, which is a, a, a target-rich environment. We are, we are ground zero for the deepest pockets in the industry. Um, there's points where, you know, if you could program for IRS, they were raining money down on you, right? I mean, you, and you, if you're a small startup studio, you can't compete with that, right? It's pay Bay Area rent prices or, you know, work on this mobile game. In, in you know and eat ramen for a couple of months um, so I've you know I've had probably 50% of my programmers have been poached by either Zynga uh, Facebook or Google over the past few years and on the one hand I'm happy to see them go right <coughs> they're getting a big, big fat paycheck they're getting free food they're getting you know to work on a campus where you know they can literally build anything they want so I can't begrudge them taking the jump but I it meant I had to come up with a different way to do this, right? Um, and you know, so so I started uh, by learning how to code myself. And this sort of feeds back again, you know, I um, because of the way that I got into art and because of the way that I got into games by doing this sort of self assemblage, um, I approached coding with the same uh, with the same attitude, right? It wasn't. I'm going to go back to school and take computer classes and learn how to, you know, set up my white space properly and, and, and how to assemble all of my my, uh, my libraries in the proper order. It was, I need this thing to move. Who can tell me out there in the world on the internet, how can I find the information to make this object move from point A to point B? Okay, so I take that piece of information and I put it in my library. So there's huge gaps in my programming knowledge. Um, and I do find, as I, as I meet and talk to other programmers, that this is not at all uncommon, right? You tend to work on your, on, you know, you, you, if you've come out with a CS degree, you have a broad base of really useful knowledge. But then as you get into games, you tend to target. Um, you have people who specialize in AI programming, and you have people who specialize in back-end programming, and you have some people who um, deal predominantly with, with user interface and user 
programs or experience programming. And so you will find, um, even as, as the industry continues to grow, that there's holes in everybody's knowledge. Um, and so I said, all right, let's, you know, let's have at it. Let's keep, you know, let's keep moving forward, as it were. Um, and so that's sort of the, the, the way I ended up transitioning from one to <laughs> 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 it, was, it was that repeated connection with the programming um, that, uh, that made it possible. And it's, you know, a lot of these things, what I was doing, it didn't seem relevant to the outside viewer, right? I mean, why is an English major playing with spark stations, right? Why does the, the um, cow animator need to know how to connect the, the UI to the database to, to bring up uh, character inventory, right? Why on earth is a mobile game designer up at the wall of shame at Black Hat? Which actually I haven't done, that's on my bucket list, but that's a story for another day. Um, so that's, you know, the, the transition for me from, from art to programming came about as a, a combination of a matter of necessity and it, with all things access, right? I had programmers that I worked with who were happy to show me how to do something or said, oh yeah, you just need to tweak this variable here. Or here's, you know, here's a write-up that somebody did that was really good on how to use LERPs in Unity, right? And so all of that, those puzzle pieces, I was able to put together to sort of make the jump um, from being an artist to being a programmer. Um, so, so that's the story of how I changed paths in the industry. <coughs> Let me give you a little bit of, of information on, the, on sort of how that fed into what we're doing now at Bushido and some of the things that we've done to keep our studio up and running um, in the Bay Area, which um, is, you know, I think we did, we've done pretty good over the past couple of years. We're definitely not the biggest studio out there. Um, we're definitely not the smallest studio out there. Um, but we still have the lights on, and we're still able to uh, to keep producing product um, on a on a slow but regular basis. Um, now, Bushigo is a Unity development house, so we use Unity exclusively. Um, we develop for iOS, Android, and Windows Phone. Um, Windows Phone takes a little extra fancy dancing, but by and large, like everything else, Unity has a very solid um, conversion. Um, most of the time when we have to go back and, and change the code for Windows, it's because of something clever we invented. Um, if we stick with the stuff that everybody knows how to do, how to translate you know, meshes from point A to point B, how to work with the physics, all that kind of stuff, that goes beautifully to pretty much any of the, any of the uh, platforms that Unity exports to. It's when you start getting weird. Um, so we do quick time events in our games. Um, and we've come up with a method by which we can we can call these <coughs> from within Unity, and they play out um, either using usually using the built-in video player uh, on whatever device that you're on. Windows Phone doesn't like this very much, however. Okay. Microsoft has that particular piece locked down, so we had to do some um, some clever engineering to get around it. But by and large, uh, it's a pretty simple uh, transition to make. Um, so what we've done is we've built a, a, a modular system for our game design and for our game execution. Um, it's hard to get a programmer full time when you know you're paying them in equity and pizza. Um, and I don't like to get people to work for equity and pizza. I would much rather pay people than try to convince them that this is the coolest thing since sliced bread. Because this is the games industry, right? It's got a 50-50 chance of being as awesome as I am absolutely convinced that it will be. So I'd rather pay you for your time and your expertise um, than, than run out the dog and pony show. So what we do is we, um, we compartmentalize everything. So we build out our design document, and then we take it and we chop it, chop it up into discrete pieces. And by now, we have a pretty good idea of what types of code needs to have what types of hooks to be able to intersect with another piece of code. And so we will bring in um, specialists, we will bring in programmers that we know have experience with doing this type of product or that type of product, and we will give them a piece of the game to make. And a lot of this comes out of the fact that, you know, people may have two weeks and they'll be on vacation and they're like, all right, you know what, 
you can't pay me as much as I'd like, but I'm on vacation. I'd rather be programming. I can, you know, I can build you this small, discrete piece, right? And that's the big fear of all contractors, is that you sign up to do one thing, and then it grows. And they're like, can you just add an extra line of code here? And can you just change that one little thing there? And suddenly, what was a weekend-long programming <coughs> project, or a weekend-long art project, this happens easily as often to artists as opposed to programmers, turns into six months. And you have no idea where the time went. And you didn't get paid six months worth by a long shot. And so we break everything up and we send it out to different professionals. And a lot of times they're people we've worked with, either at major studios or we've worked with in the past. Um, we do bring people in a lot, um, but there is a 50-50 chance that they will ghost before their piece of the project, whether it be an artist or whether it be a programmer. Um, a lot of times, it takes a lot of discipline to be able to work from home or to be able to work after hours when you would rather be out going and getting a beer with friends or when you would, you know, when you've got three kids <coughs> and your wife would like you to come home so that, you know, she can have a glass of wine and take a nap. Um, so, uh, so the programmers that we go to first are ones that we have worked with and that we know have the discipline necessary to execute what we have asked them to execute within the time frame and without disappearing. Um, we do weekly stand-ups on Skype. We have a Skype channel that has been open for five years. Um, it's a group channel. We bring people in and take them out. And then anytime anybody has uh, a question, they throw it into the Skype channel. And so you check it all the time. It's just open on your computer. So if you're an artist, they'll put your name in there. Hey, Bob, I ran into this thing. Um, and it keeps a constant open line of communication without being as invasive as having everybody's webcams on. Um, and, you know, and you learn people's hours. <coughs> you know that, that, that uh, your 2D artist has a day job working for App Annie, and so they can't possibly be online until 6 o'clock in the evening. And so you may tweak your schedule um, to work uh, you know, around that time frame. We have programmers that uh, we've brought in to handle uh, back-end engineering from the Ukraine, and they work almost on an on opposite schedule that we do. So as our team is going to bed and closing up shop for the night, they are coming online, which on the one hand is a little frustrating because you know if you want to have a face-to-face -face conversation, you have to be up at like 4 in the morning. But on the other hand, we can keep production going almost 24 hours without impinging on any individual's um, you know, sleep. Right, the, the team here in the U.S. can complete the project to a certain point, then they can hand it off to the Ukraine and they can complete it to a certain point, and then they might hand it off to uh, a UX developer that we work with who's in India, and then that, so we can push it around the clock if we have to. Um, we try not to because that does get very, it doesn't get grading. What happens is you sort of get this zone going, and then if something goes wrong or if something goes too far off track, the whole thing goes whoosh and you have to start over, and you sort of have to build everybody back into it. Um, the other benefit to working like this is that it makes the products that we're working on for clients a little more secure, um, because we do pull in uh, programmers and artists from all over the world. Sometimes we have clients who are concerned. right? They are not comfortable having uh, programmers uh, in Russia working on their project. They're afraid something's going to get stolen. They're going to, afraid that the work they're paying for is going to be repurposed. But by having everything compartmentalized, uh, most clients are okay with that. It's like, okay, this programmer is only going to have one piece. They're not going to have your entire game, or they're not going to have access to your entire app. So that makes it a little bit easier dealing with clients who are worried about uh, different levels of security. And we've run into clients who absolutely will not uh, allow you to work with overseas contractors at all. Everything has to be done within the U.S. In some cases, everything has to be done within the building, and you're not allowed to use anybody outside uh, at all. But those are sort of extreme cases, uh, usually because somebody's not terribly inexperienced, or usually because they're coming from uh, a military background, or they're coming from uh, you know uh, programming in cybersecurity or something like that. Um,